So um, yeah. we, can, we can start. I'm I'm sharing my, the slides, but just let me know. I mean, I guess. Uh, yeah, I I can see it. Perfect. Okay, just let me know next slide and. Yeah. I mean, it's just a recap of yesterday's, um, you know, introduction. So it's nothing. Sounds yeah. lovely. <laughs> Hello, Randy. Hey, Randy. All right, we are on the top of the hour, so we can start. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to session three um, of a ANOW 2021. So this is day two. Um, Andra and myself um, are pleased to welcome you to this uh, third session um, in which we will talk about uh, interconnection and routing. Um, so we have two talks. Um, one from uh, Romain von Tube from IIJ, uh, talking about hunting BGP zombies in the wild. And the next talk is going to be on uh, meta peering towards automated ISP PS selection by um, Shahzeb Mustafa. My name is Amrish Fukia. I work for the Internet Society as an internet measurement and data expert. And, and I guess we can start, first of all, um, let me introduce Romain. Romain is a senior researcher at IIJ. His current research interests include traffic modeling, network, data analytics, and anomaly detection. Mitiko, can you please play the video for um, the first presentation? Please. Hello everyone, this is Romain Fontaine from IAJ Research Lab, and today I will present our latest results on BGP zombies. So first let me explain what a BGP zombie is. So this figure represents uh, how um, one prefix is seen by um, risk routers. On the y-axis here you have all the risk routers, and on the x-axis you have time. The prefix we are looking at is one of the RIS uh, BGP beacon prefix. And the um, green circle here shows that the uh, prefix is announced by uh, one of the router. Then the green line shows that the uh, prefix is active. Yeah, sorry, just one second. I misconfigured the, the audio device. So the volume was very faint. Just give me a couple of seconds and I'll fix this. Sure. So while we wait, maybe I can just tell everybody that uh, we corrected from yesterday and now you do have slides in the data tracker in case you want to go there and check at least all the talks from yesterday and today have the, the slides there. So I just wanted to add that. Thanks. Hello everyone, this is Romain Fontaine from IAJ Research Lab, and today I will present our latest results on BGP zombies. So first let me explain what a BGP zombie is. So this figure represents uh, how um, one prefix is seen by um, risk routers. On the y-axis here you have all the risk routers, and on the x-axis you have time. The prefix we are looking at is one of the RIS uh, BGP beacon prefix. And the um, green circle here shows that the uh, prefix is announced by uh, one of the router. Then the green line shows that the uh, prefix is active in the router uh, routing table. And the red cross shows that the prefix is withdrawn by the router. 
So here it means the uh, prefix is active uh, for two hours, then it's withdrawn uh, for two hours, and then it's announced again for two hours, and withdrawn again, and announced again. And this is uh, what we expect from uh, BGP uh, beacons. But you can see that there is uh, three lines here that uh, represent um, three router uh, that think that this uh, prefix is active during this time, even though we know that the prefix was withdrawn uh, by RIBE. And this is what we call uh, BGP zombies. So here we have three zombies. Um, in, in summary, uh, a BGP zombie is an active uh, entry in a routing table that correspond to a prefix that is, in fact, withdrawn by its originator. So we've looked, in the past, we've looked at these um, BGP zombies, and we used um, BGP beacons to do that. That was a work we published in PAN 2019. But it didn't really tell us anything about the regular prefixes we're using on the internet. And this is uh, the goal we set for this work here. We want to see, we want to monitor um, BGP zombies for regular prefixes and see if it was if it's as bad as what we've seen for uh, beacons. So, for beacons, uh, the finding zombie was very easy because we knew uh, already when the prefix is withdrawn and when it's announced again. But here, because we are looking at any prefix on the internet, we have to find out uh, when uh, an originator is going to withdraw a prefix. And to do that, we are looking at a metric, which is the number of active routers for a prefix. It's shown here in that figure. So that metric range between uh, zero and one. One means that all the router we are using uh, see that prefix as active. So it might decrease a bit, and there's some noise in, in this metric, just meaning that some router might uh, withdraw the prefix. There is some topological change uh, that can happen on the, on the internet that could cause this uh, noise. But when we see a significant drop, and it's when things start to get interesting, either the drop will go uh, down to zero. In this case, it means that all the router we're using, they always run the, the prefix. If it goes down and then up again, and then stabilize, that means this, um, there was uh, uh, some significant change in the, the topology. So maybe that prefix was uh, withdrawn and then re-announced by the same origin or different origin. Uh, but what is uh, interesting for us is to see when there's a significant change, a significant drop, and then this metric, the number of active uh, routers, um, is stable but at a low value. Here it means that only a few routers uh, didn't withdraw that uh, prefix, and if, it's, if it lasts for a certain time, um, then we're gonna uh, say that uh, this is a BGP zombie. So this is our definition of the BGP zombie. Uh, when we see the majority of the router have withdrawn the prefix, we're gonna wait 90 minutes. And after 90 minutes, if we see that the prefix was not completely, completely withdrawn, or it wasn't re-announced, then we're gonna say this is a zombie. You can check the paper for, for some of the details why we use uh, 90 minutes, uh, we have some uh, explanation for that in the paper. I don't have time to explain it. So using this uh, very simple uh, zombie detector, we analyzed six years of BGP data and found uh, 6.5 million of BGP zombies. And we looked at different uh, things in, in these zombies. First, we ran some uh, sanity checks. I will uh, explain uh, the next slide. And we also look at some of the characteristics of zombies in the wild. One of the first sanity check we've done is to look at what we call the state coherence between uh, recipes. So here's an example of um, a zombie that appears in AS3. So AS3 um, is reporting a pass to a certain prefix. This pass is uh, AS3, AS2, AS1, AS0. So uh, AS3 tells us that it can reach that prefix through these ASs, uh, but we have access to one of these AS through this, and, and that AS tells us that it has withdrawn this prefix. So because those two information are conflicting, um, we say that the states here are incorrect. One of the risk tells us that 
it has a path to, to a prefix. Uh, but on this path, we see that one of the AS has actually withdrawn the prefix. So this um, really tells us that there is in fact a, a zombie and it's not a misclassification. So we use that to validate our result. Uh, but to do that, we have to have pass, zombie pass with at least two risk peers in the, in the US pass. So uh, about 68% of the zombie pass we detected detected have uh, two risk peers. And for this 68% of pass, we found that almost 95% of them have incoherent states. Uh, so that means they are really uh, zombies. And the rest are not really conclusive because um, it could be that the two risk peers uh, we have access to, they both are affected by the zombie. So we cannot really say if it's uh, a misclassification or not. Another thing we looked at is uh, where the beacons in our result. And we found that um, the risk BGP beacons uh, account for 3.2% of all the zombies we detected. And 3.2% seems to be a small value, but actually it's very big uh, because there is only 27 uh, risk beacon prefixes out of the over 800,000 uh, prefixes we have on the internet. So only those uh, few prefixes have created a lot of zombies. And um, one of the questions we had then was, uh, OK, maybe uh, noisier prefixes like um, HP beacons are more prone to zombies. And this is what we looked at in this figure. We took, um, we took the prefixes that had a lot of zombies, and we look at the number of updates uh, for these uh, prefixes. And you can see that as the number of updates is increasing, the chance to have uh, zombies is also increasing. Uh, one takeaway from uh, this is that uh, beacons are not really representative of uh, what we observe for the uh, regular prefixes. And this was especially true for IPv4. And we also looked at uh, zombies for popular uh, content networks. So we took uh, 42 ASN that are commonly found in the top 15 Alexa, Umbrella, and Majestic uh, list. And we looked at how many zombies there are. Here's the ranking of this uh, ASN and over time. And you can see that some of them are zombie uh, almost every month. We did this only for two years in 2018 and 2019. Um, and we looked a bit more at this ASN. We looked at a different characteristic. And what we found was that um, the top ASN uh, popular uh, content networks um, usually have also uh, either like uh, they announce a lot of prefixes or they are very long um, AS passwords. And if we think about it, it, it kind of makes sense um, if we assume that uh, BGP zombies are due to uh, bugs in routers, then um, uh, a long AS pass length means they're going to imply more uh, routers and thus more chance to hit one of these bugs. And finally, in the paper, we looked at some of the side effects of BGP zombies. Uh, we found that uh, 77,000 zombies uh, created uh, the tools. Uh, for example, it would be cases where um, the path will follow uh, backup links instead of the, the usual um, AS path we'll see. And uh, we also found that uh, some zombies have um, an origin that is different than its uh, covering prefix because that, that route is stuck, uh, then we might have a, a wrong uh, origin AS information. Um, I won't give the detail here, but uh, you can look at the paper. In some cases, uh, the uh, BGP zombies can uh, create uh, routing loops, and we found uh, over 400 of uh, potential routing loops in our result. I also advise you to look at uh, this presentation from Kielnok, uh last year, where they give a concrete example of uh, routing loops, and also the address route to, uh, to show that. Okay, so that concludes my presentation. In this work, we look at BGP zombies for uh, regular prefixes. Uh, we found that zombies are widely spread. Uh, we found zombies for very um, uh, popular content networks. Uh, it's 
even though it's widely spread, it's not as bad as what the uh, our past study uh, using BGPBCon was suggesting. And uh, also here in this work, we find some interesting uh, side effects uh, from BGP zombies. Thank you for listening. All right, so um, you can start queuing up and ask question to Roma. Um, is Roma, are you here? Yes, great. Good morning. Thank you, good morning. So do we have questions for Roma? If not, I have a question for you. Um, so uh, my first question would be, what do you think could be the cause? Uh, could be the cause of these PGP zombies? Is it faulty routers? Um, what could okay. be the causes? Yeah. Um, thank you. That's a very good question, and that's definitely something is uh, missing in our study. Uh, it's it's simply missing because it's uh, it's very hard to check uh, all the causes of zombies. Um, the main cause we think is is uh, yes faulty routers and bugs in in routers. Um, but uh, yeah, because it's, it's just like very hard to check uh, all the different uh, you know software version and in in uh, it's probably a lot of uh, corner cases where things yeah. that, uh, don't work. Uh, it's it's hard to check, yeah, but uh, that's what we think. It's a prime. Okay. Okay. And, and and do you have an idea of what perhaps could operators do or implement to you know to mitigate the effects of, of zombies? Um so what we've heard from uh, operators is um they sometimes see those uh, zombies appearing and uh, the common practice is to re-announce prefixes and we withdraw them because um so when you withdraw a prefix you have like a small very small chance that a, a zombie appear and mm -hmm. uh by just re-announcing and re-withdrawing is it seems to uh, usually um remove uh, zombies that appears uh we've heard from some that did just reset their all uh BGP session, which is a bit, uh, a bit brutal, but <laughs> that's a good old way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think the the main problem for operators is to monitor this, to find, to know that there is, a, in fact, a, a problems. Right. And uh, for that, we, and for for the paper, we we do monitor uh, zombies. Uh, but in real time, it's uh, it's sometimes a bit hard to do because you have to, uh, if you use recent raw views, that's a lot of data to process. Mm. Um, so it can be a pain of like taking all this data. Um, but still like RI provides some tools like uh, BGP Play, for example, where, where people can look at uh, how their um, prefixes is uh, are seen by uh, by risk okay i see uh, we have one person uh, in the queue colin you can you can proceed hi uh, can you hear me <coughs> yes. yes yes good hi uh, nice talk um, so this this is uh, not even close to my area so this this question may be uh, complete <laughs> may make very little sense uh, I, I was wondering if you were seeing any difference in behavior between uh, ipv4 and ipv6 prefixes um, given that the the, inter the interpretation is that it may be router bugs and they may be exercising different code paths yeah yeah <laughs> very good very question, good question. So, the, in this paper, I don't think we've done uh, much comparison between IPv4 and IPv6, but uh, we had a, a previous paper on that, and we've seen, the bad news is we've seen uh, much more zombies in uh, IPv6. Um, 
And one reason we really dig into the, the results for that one. And we, 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 saw, we saw that uh, um, one of the network was creating a lot of zombies and we contacted them and uh, they were saying that, uh, yeah, they had, they had some problem with uh, their IPv6 and they were restarting their, their BGP sessions when uh, they had customer complaints. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. in the queue, please proceed. Hi, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Ramon. Thank you so much for the talk. Very interesting. So I'm just wondering, because I mean, you process so much data, and I know that going through all the information from RIS and from Rogers is just uh, you know, complete uh, a work in itself. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to do that. So may maybe I missed this. Um, I'm just wondering how much of what you're seeing as zombies are actual zombies and how much is just, you know, some, some hiccups or accidents that may occur or, or have you been able to separate um, reliably these two? And maybe a follow-up is just, have you seen like some big offenders in the sense of, you know, somebody who may, you know, generate too many zombies? Or um, do, do you see sort of like a very skewed distribution in the, uh, you know, origin of, of these zombies? So again, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question too. Um, so in... Um, uh, in this paper, we didn't really look at the source of zombie, but the previous one uh, did a bit more work on that. And um, we found, uh, so we were, um, we had a technique to, to find what is the source, which is where the, the zombie created. And um, it was, uh, it was not really like, there was like not one big offender. It was like uh, changing quite a lot, and that also uh, gave us some more uh, evidence that there is like those bugs. It's it's a bit random, like how how the zombie are created. Um, so last time we worked with uh, BGP Risbicon, and they are just doing the same thing like over and over, like every four hours. Um, but even though they are always doing the same thing, we could see that uh, zombies appear at different places in the network. Um, so even though we have like this very controlled environment, you know, things were changing all the time. Um, and, and for the, the first question is um, how we check like there are really uh, zombies. So in this paper, we did like some of this sanity check, like um, uh, the, the difficulty with, with this work now was that we're working with uh, past data. We use like six years of, of BGP data. So it's very hard to go back in the past and check, you know, what really will happen. Um, but the, the previous studies, we uh, did run trace routes. So every time we found a zombie, we run trace routes and we could confirm that every time, like we see like a few routers that will um, uh, forward the, the packets. And then we receive a ICMP message saying that uh, the network is unreachable. So we could confirm that, uh, and I don't remember exactly the number, but it's like over 90% are really zombies. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so I see Jared in the queue. So we will take the last question before closing. Go ahead, Jared. Uh, yeah, Jared Mach, Akamai. Um, I mentioned that because in your paper you highlight uh, a number of our prefixes that apparently regularly get, you know, get stuck and such. Uh, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of things that contribute to, to, to that on our side, and we've definitely been trying to improve uh, some of our prefix stability efforts as well, um, you know, because we have a large set of distributed deployments, uh, and then a lot of them, a lot of these, like the 16625 AS originated prefixes, those are all uh, coming from BGP speakers that run on uh, either on routers or on servers. 
uh, specifically that may may be more likely to actually have some uh, negative operational <laughs> impacts when when those things are put into service or taken out. Uh, and when we've been trying to improve uh, the prefixes, so I'd, I'd be interested just to to know or see if you're still seeing this from us and if it's improved recently because we've been undertaken a number of efforts to improve this. Oh, that's oh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. That's very interesting. Then um, I guess yeah, we could check again and and see like if there was uh, some uh, improvements. And but but again, um, one thing I'd like to mention is. Um, I remember for Akamai, we see, uh, because you announce a lot of like very small prefixes, I think at different places in the network, uh, sometimes we see a very long AS pass for these prefixes. And I'm guessing that, uh, so, so zombies will appear for those like very long uh, AS pass. And, and I'm guessing that this has like little to no impact for your traffic because that's probably where not, uh, it's not the place where you're gonna uh, direct your, your clients. But, uh, yeah, we, we, yeah, we have a lot of distributed unique deployments as well as uh, we now have uh, actually three different backbones that we operate that interconnect all of our sites together. So depending upon where the regional interconnection is, for uh, the the distribution of the content into uh, into a customer network, you know, you, you know, in Japan it might be different than in India than somewhere else. Um, you know, obviously you'll see different AS paths, uh, you know, for those based upon the the relationships we have with the service provider. So uh, it's it's quite possible that you know some of the prefixes might be negatively impacted uh, depending upon that upstream provider. Uh, you know, network property, and 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 we actually have, we have teams who are actually working full time. You know, going and chasing things like that around, uh, as well as systems that kind of monitor and detect it. But they, they tend to just take things out of service, uh, and then a human has to go and chase down and figure out what what happened. Um, you know, we quite often see. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it, it should be no surprise to anybody who's looked at BGP research. Uh, we see a lot of interesting events all the time, and so when the systems just take stuff out of service automatically, it's it's really you know it's doing that to improve the customer experience, and, and that happens all day, every day. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thanks. Thank you, Jared. So this brings us to the end of your presentation, Roma. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming here uh, so early for you. Um, uh, yeah, thank you thank very you. much. So we can yeah, move. Thank you very much. Bye bye. We can move to our next speaker, um, who is Shazeb, uh, who is a PhD student at the University of Central Florida and is currently working as a research assistant at the Networks and Wireless Systems Lab. His key interest areas of research are network architecture, internet peering, and data analytics. Um, please play the the new the next video please Hi everyone my name is Shazay Mustafa and I will be presenting MetaPeering today so finding a suitable ISP to pair with is a slow process and ISP admins put a lot of effort and a lot of uh, time into selecting suitable peers why is that because ISP admins often attend events sponsored by peering DB nano nano etc where they network with each other. And using these events, they identify ISPs for potential peering. And after they negotiate, uh, after that, they negotiate traffic exchange terms and conditions, which uh, may include traffic, the max traffic volume they are willing to exchange or the specific points that they are willing to pair at, or whether or not it will be a pay, public pairing, et cetera, et cetera. And then after this step, um, if and only if both of the I Hi everyone, my name is Shahzain Mustafa and I will be presenting Meta Peering today. So finding a suitable ISP to pair with is a slow process and ISP admins put a lot of effort and a lot of uh, time into selecting suitable peers. Why is that? Because 
ISP admins often attend events sponsored by peering DB Nano, et cetera, where they network with each other. And using these events, they identify ISPs for potential peering. And after they negotiate, uh, after that, they negotiate traffic exchange terms and conditions, which uh, may include traffic, the max traffic volume they are willing to exchange or the specific points that they are willing to pair at, or whether or not it will be a pay, public pairing, et cetera, et cetera. And then after this step, um, if and only if both of the ISPs agree to the terms and conditions, the BGP forwarding rules are written. Uh, so the deployment actually takes uh, takes place. So, I mean, um, overall, since the whole process requires a ton of manual work, it is extremely slow and it uh, oftentimes takes a couple weeks to months. And even with such an elaborate and lengthy process, finding the right peer is hard. And um, say you've put in like two months into selecting your peer, it's not guaranteed that it's it's going to be an optimal uh, option. Because see, the internet is far more dynamic than these interconnection deals, which means that uh, during the negotiation and finding process, there uh, plenty of great peering opportunities are discarded. Um, under or overestimation of various metrics can lead to future disagreements. ISPs can be part of suboptimal relations knowingly or unknowingly. And we have also uh, seen cases of ISPs ending peering, co peering contracts because of disagreements and violations. Now, bad selection can also mean that your resources are not optimally utilized. So um, sort of your load balancing factor is suboptimal. And in the bigger picture uh, and in the longer run, such uh, relations, suboptimal relations, uh, or disagreements, or missed opportunities, everything, uh, in the longer run, such relations can hurt ISPs, both ISPs, financially. So it's clear why it's so important for these to be optimal and um, along with that to be dynamic. So if you've identified an issue, you can fix it quickly. Now we present MetaPeering, a tool that will help identify optimal peering ISP pairs. And uh, it also gives you the best peering contracts. So say for two given ISPs, we need to decide whether or not they should be peering. And if yes, which particular locations they should be peering at. So we first calculate the traffic matrices for both the ISPs, which is sort of their internal traffic flow. We calculate these using POP or points of presence locations, which are locations where an ISP has connection capability. So this can be an IXP or um, a private facility too. We also identify the locations where both these ISPs have a presence uh, because these are the points where peering is possible. Uh, then we gather the gridded population data for the United States, which basically divides the whole country into small segments. And now we know the population for each of these segments. And we take all of this data, all of these computations, and feed them into this policy generator machine, which uh, churns it up, extracts all the useful information. Um, it knows what's important, what's not. So it, it does that while respecting any additional peering policies injected using the policy filter. Now, how does it do that? It basically gives out three different uh, outputs. The first is, so it basically uses the pop locations and the population data to construct an overlap map between the two ISPs. And uh, what it represents is the number of people each ISP presumably uh, covers and how many more people can become accessible with a peering deal. This is summed up in the affinity score. The next one is um, I use the same pop locations and also the traffic matrix matrices to give out um, peering willingness scores for each of the common populations from the perspective of both ISPs. So the overall willingness score for the uh, for a particular peering deal is just the average of these scores at particular points. <clears throat> Third, it optimizes the selection of populations using the individual willingness scores to generate acceptable peering contracts. 
we then take the geometric mean of the willingness score, which is the representative of the willingness to pair, and affinity score, which is the representative of the non-overlapping areas and population, um, to get the felicity score, which tells us whether or not these ISPs should pair. Now, um, please note that these scores are novel. They're not like an industry standard. We came up with these scores uh, and we have discussed how we came up with this and what they represent. So with the Felicity score, um, ISP admins can set a threshold. Okay, if this pair has a Felicity score of more than 0.6 or 0.7, we'll be pairing, otherwise we will not. So this is the deciding factor for whether or not they should be pairing. And along with that, we give them the acceptable pairing contracts that, okay, if you decide to pair, these are the locations that you should be pairing at. Now, both of these results can be used by ISP admins to decide whether a pairing deal will be uh, worth it. <clears throat> now, in an effort to expedite the development of this model, we have deployed um, a web application to showcase the workings of this tool. These screenshots provide an overview of the website. Uh, for Sprint and eBay, we can see the overlap map, so, uh, which is calculated using the POP locations, uh, as mentioned earlier. We can also see the willingness scores for each of the contracts that are possible. Not all of them are listed in the screenshot, but they are possible. Uh, and at the bottom, we can see a sample contract recommendation, uh, which is given uh, Sprint and eBay decide that they are peering, Meta peering, our tool recommends that they should be peering in Los Angeles and Chicago. Uh, so the website lists top three such contracts. So this is the best one. And then there's the second best option and the third best option. And just for reference, uh, here's another example for Columbus and eBay. And in this case, the same um, overlap map is given, the willingness graph is given, and a sample um, contract is given. But in this particular case, our model does not recommend peering. But in case they do end up deciding that they should peer, they should peer at San Jose and Ashburn. We tested this model on 23 different ISPs, uh, which basically means 506 pairs using two, two heuristics. Now the x-axis, um, we can see on the x-axis, we can see the ISP pair type where A is axis, C is content, and T is transit. So AT, for example, means that it is an axis transit ISP pair. First, uh, so the first heuristic, the ISP view, we recommend peering if any one of the two ISPs has a felicity score greater than a certain threshold. In this case, we used 0 0.55. For the second um, heuristic, the holistic view, we'd recommend peering if and only if both of the ISPs have a felicity score greater than 0 0.55. Uh, the figures show a slightly more detailed confusion matrix, sort of. So the top left is the true positive, the pairs we suggested and were peering according to KEDA. Bottom right shows the true negative, the pairs we didn't suggest peering and were also not Peering according to data, uh, KEDA. The top right shows the new recommendations that we generate, and the bottom left shows the peering ISPs that we recommend that they should not be peering. And it can be, it can be seen that there's a lot of missed opportunities and sub, uh, some suboptimal relations as well. We believe that meta peering is a step in the direction of a more dynamic and automated inter ISP relation management, and we are working on an extended model, a more complex model, uh, a more complex meta pairing model, which uh, uses um, machine learning techniques to learn from previous data to learn what's important uh, in a pairing deal before giving out its recommendations. So um, this concludes my presentation. Uh, I hope you liked it. If you have any related questions, I would be happy to address them now. Thank you, Shazay, uh, and welcome. Uh, I see we already have one person in the queue. Uh, Randy, you can go ahead. OK. Um, <clears throat> clear my mind. When you're waiting up here and you 
is when you say one of the serious weights is population, do you mean the number of human beings? Uh, I'm sorry, can, uh, you, repeat I'm sorry, the can you repeat the question? So, so. When you're giving the weight to a particular ISP and you use the term population, are you talking about the number of human beings? Correct, yes. The regional population. That kind of seems to assume this is all eyeballs. And there's a lot more to the internet than eyeballs. There's content and eye candy and infrastructure, etc. So how are those accounted for? Yeah, so the metrics that we use um, assume that traffic is rich, uh, is directly related to these eyeballs that you, as you mentioned, and it's directly proportional to the population around that area. So assuming that there are eyeballs, um, the traffic originating from that area is directly proportional to the area that all of the pops um, it will cover. So it's just a heuristic measure um, which we use in approximating the peering suggestions. But if you're heavily weighted towards eyeballs, traffic tends to go to eyeballs, not from eyeballs. So in this particular case, we're assuming uh, an even distribution. So two eyeballs and two, uh, from eyeballs. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Uh, do we have any additional question? Um, if not, I might have one. So, uh, Shazeb, for example, did you take uh, into account the cost of peering and also the cost of transit? Uh, for example, what percentage of you know of of saving someone would do uh, by 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 peering in your model for selection of a peer? Uh, for this particular project, we have not uh, focused on the economic side, but um, another project that we are currently working on focuses just on the economic side, so optimizing peer selection uh, based on how much you can save. So that's, yeah, that is something that we are working on. Maybe in the future, these two projects combine. Uh, but right now, in this project, uh, we haven't considered that. Okay, thank you. Do we have additional questions? I don't think so. Um, if not, I might have another one. Uh, so I see that you focus your 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 model based on data coming from from the US. So. Uh, do you intend to expand it to other regions of the world where perhaps uh, interconnection is a little bit different than uh, the USC. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we've seen uh, that the trends, pairing trends, and interconnection trends are different, especially for European ISPs. So the um, the reason that we have focused on US is because the model needs to train using pairing trends, right? So if we combine two, it'll be a problem. But Yes, the same model can be trained for European ISPs where different matrices have different weightage. Okay. Simply because how IXPs are established over there. All right. Um, so I'm watching my clock. So we still have one minute if anyone has a last question or uh, even a question to, to the previous speaker. Please, please proceed. I don't see anyone in the queue, so I'll hand over to Andra. Thank you very much, uh, Shazek and Roma. Thank you.
so hi everyone yeah thanks so much we just uh, are closing session number three so i'll invite Edmundo to help us chair session four um Edmundo, if you could share also maybe this the slides or, or if not just let me know and i can share them just to remind people how we're gonna run the session okay And well, I think we lost you. Uh, I'm here. Okay, because we, 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 we don't see the slides. I don't know if, uh, should I try oh, to share? Oh, you want to share? Okay. I thought you want to... Oh, uh, just let me try. Just a second. So maybe we can already start now the, the session. Because I think, you see my slides now? Yep. <clears throat> okay, great. So I'll just hand it over to you. So thank you so much for, for helping us with the session. I'll leave you in good hands. Okay. okay. Can you see uh, the this, my session slides? Or I guess you... Uh, I'd like to show this, the, to share my screen. Okay. It, uh, I was going to share my slides here, but if you have, perhaps it's easier that if you share yours. Uh, okay. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Edmundo uh, de Suzy Silva. It's a pleasure to be here and we have a very nice session on monitoring the internet traffic. Uh, today we have four papers. Uh, and uh, 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 first paper towards cross-layer telemetry will be presented by uh, uh, Justin Human. The second paper, uh, it's about uh, uh, the spin bit, uh, also measurements, then the detection uh, consumer IoT device, how you detect the IoTs uh, in the wild for the lens of ISP. And the last paper is on the evolution of internet flows. So it's uh, uh, the way you are going to run the session. We allow a very short question after each presentation, and then you have a panel at the end, a 15-minute panel. Is that correct, Andra? So without further ado, not to take time from the speakers, Let's go to the first uh, presentation. Uh, uh, Justin Human from University of Liège. He's uh, uh, on research unit for in networking. So please, can you uh, show the video, please? Um, sorry, Andra here. There's no sound for me. I'm not sure if other people have the same issue. I don't know if you can help us with that. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Justin from the University of Liège in Belgium. And today in this talk, I'm going to introduce you to something that we have called cross-layer telemetry. So basically, we try to find uh, a name as explicit as possible, and I will go much into detail about this. 
But first, uh, let me remind you some basics. So we moved from a kind of monolithic architecture to uh, microservices. So you can see microservices everywhere now. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, mainly that uh, it's easier and faster to deploy, to maintain, but there are also uh, other uh, reasons. Um, so if you look at this kind of architecture, and let's assume there is a problem somewhere, and I ask you to, to debug and to, to find the problem here, you would tell me, okay, easy game, right? But what about this one? So it gets a little bit more complicated, right? So hopefully, for that kind of spaghetti uh, microservice architecture, you have uh, application management performance, which is actually application performance management, sorry. And in this case, uh, more specifically, you have distributed tracing tools. In this talk, I will uh, take Jaeger as an example, uh, but you have to know that there are a lot of other alternatives. Uh, Jaeger is just a famous uh, one uh, in all of them. Uh, so such tool is very useful uh, when we are dealing with microservices. And they all have something in common. They all have the same notion, the same concept uh, of trace and spans. So you can see a trace as a hierarchy of trace and spans. So a trace can contain subtraces and also spans. And you can see a span as um, a unit of work of code. So this is just a part of your code that you want to monitor, right? And here at the bottom of the slide, you can see a screenshot of uh, the Jaeger uh, visualization. So you have basically uh, a main trace, which contains two subtraces, and each trace has some, some uh, uh, child uh, span. So here, a span, and then a span, a child span, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see on the, re on the left that you have a clear visualization of the flow of the code path. And on the right, you have the time taken by each part. So it's very useful for those, those two reasons. You can see, as I said, the path taken by your code. So if you execute this one, what is going to be uh, triggered, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see the time that it took. But such tool is limited to layer five and, and above. So if you have a problem, uh, low level, uh, low level issue, so a network issue, for instance, well, that's when you're facing problem. And to just to cite an example, let's assume that my database lookup is slow. So I can see in Jaeger that my database lookup is slow because I traced it. In that case, maybe should I just blame the app or should I put the blame on the server or even the database? Or maybe this is a network issue or actually it can be anything else. So it's hard to, 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 to know exactly what, what it is. So you don't know why and you don't even know where exactly the problem is. So the only thing that you know is what Jaeger tells you, it's that it's slow, that's all. So let's just see the basic simple topology here. So you have the app, the database, and this guy in the middle of the path with a congestion of one of its interface. And so Jaeger will just report the slow execution time, right? So when you see this, you will investigate on the app, you will investigate on the database, and actually you wouldn't find anything. So you would be left wondering, scratching your head and wondering why it takes so long. And that's, that's a big problem because root cause analysis, it's, it's, it's hard in this case. So the goal here would be to include, also include layer three and layer four in such tool. And actually this is exactly, exactly what we provide with cross layer telemetry. And to reach such a goal, we first have to answer three, two key questions. The first one is how do we find a way to correlate the traces from the ATM with the corresponding network traffic? So back to my example, if you want to trace exactly your database lookup in your code, you want to match the trace generated by the ATM with the network traffic, with, which is the DB lookup. Okay, on the link. 
And for that, we will use IOM. So IOM is just, um, it's in situ operation administration and maintenance. It's actually used uh, to carry some useful data uh, in packets. Uh, we have developed it in the kernel and it should be available soon. Uh, why do we use IOM? Well, we want to kill two birds with one stone. So as I said, it can carry a lot of useful low-level information. So for instance, you have the queue size, uh, the buffer location, IDs of nodes and interfaces from where the packet is coming from and where it's going to, um, and so on and so on. And on the other side, we just enhance the IOM header to carry um, on, so both the trace ID and the, the span ID. So remember I, what I told you uh, about uh, the common point uh, of those tools. They all have the same notion of trace and span. So a trace ID and a span ID both represent a unique ID of a span. So that's why we uh, just uh, carry uh, the two. So the first important question is answered. Let's face the second one. When and how should we inject these IDs? So when, well, we have two possibilities, either at circuit creation or when sending data. So if you think a little bit about it, at circuit creation, it wouldn't be enough. Why? Well, because an operator could use the same socket for all connection all along, or you could have for the same connection, multiple trace. See, if you want to monitor different part of your code, you could have multiple trace on the same socket. So that's not an option to inject those IDs at socket creation. And moreover, you don't want to modify the C library because you would have to modify also high level uh, languages. And that's not an option. We want to provide a tool, uh, an improvement to those tool, which is not um, a burden. So you, you, you want to integrate it easily without changing everything. Okay, so we will just select the option of uh, in injecting those IDs when we send the data. But now how? So again, we have several possibilities. The first one that comes in mind is to modify the send uh, functions uh, offered by uh, the C library. But again, you don't want, as I said, you don't want to modify everything because if you modify this, you will have you would have to modify also high level languages, so not an option. So we are left with two other possibilities, which is to add a new syscall or use a netlink call. Again, if you add a new syscall, syscalls are not always portable, and the preferred way of doing this is usually to use a netlink call. So from a kernel perspective, it's always the best option. So we just select the netlink call as an option. So let me explain you a bit uh, this architecture of uh, cross-layer telemetry. So first of all, we have uh, a client, which is a Jaeger client in this case, which, which is used uh, to add tracing um, code to your application. And actually where, when a trace is available, it will be sent to the agent which will forward to the collector, which will apply some action on it and then store it in the database, okay? Now, we had a CLT library, which is also a client library. We had the netlink call, and we add an IOM agent and an IOM collector, okay? So the CLT library is just an abstraction of the netlink call, so the application will just pass those IDs to the CLT library. So those IDs will be injected through a netlink call and they will be injected where? Well, to the socket. So again, someone will tell, hey, this is a per socket solution. So what if you have some congestion in your queue? Maybe that one packet will be marked with those IDs and it shouldn't be. Well, you're correct. And we are currently working on a perfect solution which will be per packet. So it comes with a lot of other challenges, but I think we are pretty close to a perfect solution. But right now, this one is working pretty well, except uh, in the corner cases I, I, I mentioned. But again, uh, the, the main goal of this one is to have some in useful 
info to debug. So from layer three, layer four, as long as it's low level. It, it's not that important that you have a perfect match between the connection and traces. If you want a perfect match, then stay tuned and we will post uh, the next version, which will be a lot more uh, precise. So back to our architecture. When there is a request, so here HTTPS request, or it can be whatever it is, as long as it's network traffic. So when the packet goes out of the interface, it will be marked with the IDs that were injected here. Okay. And so actually the application or it's not important if it's an application, as long as it's a node uh, at the other side. And you have an IOM agent that will run on this part. And this one is responsible uh, for gathering IOM data. And it will forward those to the IOM collector. And this guy will just correlate IOM data and any data that you want from layer three and layer four with the IDs that you have passed. And so it will send this to the Jaeger collector. So this is a correlation request. And so the, the Jaeger collector will be responsible for just storing the correlation inside the database. And actually, as a result, you can see uh, directly in the Jaeger visualization, IOM data or layer three or four data as you want, as I said. So back to our example, you have the application database. We introduced, a, we, we simulated um, a congestion here on this guy on its, its interface. And as you can see, so this is the first node. So this is the app, second node and third node. So the second node is this one. And you can see that the egress queue is increasing. So if you are the operator, now that you see this, well, you directly find root cause analysis, okay? So you can see, okay, there is a problem in the queue. Maybe I could rebalance it or you are, you are uh, now capable of applying some actions to, to, to solve the problem. But again, without cross layer telemetry, you wouldn't have those data. So the only thing you would know is that it's slow once again. Okay. So let me conclude on this talk. Um, I definitely think that it's a hot topic in the industry. So I've heard that there is a lot, a lot of interest on this one. And I do believe that CLT solves a lot of challenges in the tracing world. Um, we are still working on, on some part to improve it. So I mentioned earlier another version which will be per packet. So to have a perfect correlation and match solution. And there, is, uh, there are also some other uh, things to improve, but not that important. So I insist on the fact that this solution is working. So this is something that you could use right now if you want. And there is uh, a link to the GitHub repo. So feel free to uh, ha have a look at it. There is also a video to demonstrate how it works. Everything is explained here, there. So feel free to visit it. And that's it for me. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Feel free to contact me on my email address, or you can ask me a question uh, right after this. Thanks again. I can't hear you, Edmundo. I keep have to press yes, allow hear. to allow. <laughs> so thank you very much for your for your presentation. Very nice too. Uh, let's see if there is anyone in the queue uh, right now to ask questions. I guess people are shy at the beginning, but I I, I have one question. Do you uh, foresee because in, in your implementation? If, if I recall, uh, uh, you have to do some stuff by hand once you get all the information. So do you foresee 
uh, uh, instead of manual intervention, can possibly implement uh, 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 potential to automated analysis uh, that could be uh, attached to your tool? Or have you thought about that? Yeah, well, we could, but you have to know that uh, below CLT, this is IOM, and so uh, this is the configuration of IOM. That is the biggest part, actually. So operators using IOM usually configure it by hand, but again, we could uh, provide some tools to to automate it. it to automate it. it. So um, we could also uh, provide a way to merge everything to the APM tool but maybe it will be a lot of burden for each tool so i think it should be uh, better to keep it kind of decentralized and maybe uh, provide some tool to configure iom yeah okay thank thanks a lot let's see if there anyone else in the queue yeah. It's a nice thing of being the chair. I keep asking questions. Then, <laughs> uh, uh, in your paper, you you have set up uh, experimentation in the lab. The, uh, are you planning anything in in uh, uh, let's say real setup? Or I'm wrong. Uh, you already did that. Uh, no, of course you're right. So it was a pretty limited test bed, uh, just for the sake of the paper. But we are definitely planning on. Uh, expanding the test bed to to have some more real test cases mm -hmm. thank you and and as you said is everything is free right i can just uh yeah I it's get free available it try to okay okay so if i i'm not mistaken okay this is just we are going to have a panel afterwards so yeah. uh, i think we should proceed and i please ask you to uh, remain until the panel so thank you very much for your presentation and uh, see you uh, uh, soon so yeah. let's uh, uh, let's let's go for the next talk okay uh, the i guess is going to be presented by ike kunzen from uh our wth Aachen university uh, he's a PhD student and a researcher, so please. Uh. Hi, my name is Ai Kunze. In our work, we have investigated the four spin bit cousins L, Q, R, and P. And in this talk, I would like to share with you some insights on their performance regarding packet loss measurements. Before I go into more detail on the different spin bit cousins, let me first give you a quick intro why work on them is actually meaningful. I think it is safe to say that network measurements have always been important to get a better understanding of what is going on inside of a network. However, measurement techniques have typically been developed independently from protocols. And thus, they oftentimes depend on externally visible protocol semantics. A prominent example are TCP sequence numbers and acknowledgements, which can be used to compute the round trip time of a connection. Let me quickly illustrate that with a short example. What we have here are two hosts interconnected by a network probe in the middle. If the host on the left-hand side now sends a packet with a certain sequence number, the network probe in the middle can store that sequence number and then basically start a timer. The packet is then forwarded as usual, and the host on the right-hand side then answers with a corresponding acknowledgement. As soon as the acknowledgement then arrives at the network probe, the network probe can basically stop the timer and compute the right-hand side half of the round trip time. Unfortunately, such techniques are no longer possible in times of encrypted transport protocols such as QUIC, because there the protocol semantics are no longer visible to an observer. To still allow for meaningful measurements, the QUIC standard features a special purpose bit, and that is the spin bit. It is a dedicated bit in the QUIC short header and visible to on-path observers. While the spin bit allows for round trip time measurements, there are also other important network properties that one might want to measure. In this context, there's an ongoing discussion in the IPPM working group focusing around four different proposals that are similar to the spin bit but enable packet loss measurements. Let me quickly explain how they work in the simple example. So we again have a server on the left hand side, a client on the right hand side and now a network probe in the middle. But this network probe now is only able to capture the traffic on the downstream path. So from the server to the client. 
The first spin bit cousin is the so-called L bit, and it builds upon end host based loss detection, as is, for example, incorporated in Quick. In other words, the end hosts detect loss, and then the L bit reports that loss into the network. Due to this design, in our setting, the server will report the overall loss on the downstream path. The second spin bit cousin is the so-called qubit or square bit. As the name implies, it generates a constant square wave signal. Or in other words, it first transmits a certain number of packets with a set qubit and then a certain number of packets with an unset qubit. The network probe can then simply count how many packets have arrived in which phase and can thus derive the packet loss that has occurred here on the downstream one link. The third approach is then called the R bit or reflection square bit and builds upon the qubit. In essence, the end hosts deploy qubit observer logic and then report the number of observed qubits back into the network. Due to this design, the R bit in our setting covers the overall upstream path as well as downstream one. Finally, we then have the so called T bit, where we basically have one train of packets which is reflected several times between the server and the client. Mapped to our setting, our observer will now only be able to compute the packet loss that has occurred on the overall link. So from the time that the train has left the observer in the one direction until it has entered the observer again from the other direction. As we can already see here, the approaches differ in which parts of the network they actually cover. And this is already the first important decision factor when we want to decide on which of these approaches we want to choose. The second aspect would then be the measurement accuracy. So how accurate can we actually determine the packet loss rates? This directly leads us to our contribution because what we have done is an experimental evaluation of the four spin bit cousins using a mini net based test bed. At this point, it is very important to have a fair comparison between the different approaches. And this is why we induce packet loss only here on the downstream one link because that is the only link that all of the four approaches can actually cover. We've then investigated three different scenarios. In the first setting, we have induced random packet loss on the downstream one link. In the second setting, we have induced burst packet loss. And for that, we have used the simple Gilbert model. And then finally, we've also considered the impact of different flow sizes on the measurement accuracy. In this talk, I will mainly focus on the first setting. So let's get directly into it. The main goal of our random loss scenario was to find out how well the different approaches perform under ideal circumstances. For this, we use symmetric traffic and disable congestion control so that there's a constant flow of packets. We then transmit roughly 1 million packets in each of our experiments and perform 30 iterations for each of our settings. We then report the cumulative loss rates that the different approaches have derived at the end of the experiments. In addition to the four approaches, we also track the ground truth, so how many packets have really been lost. What you can see in this plot is on the x-axis the configured loss rates and on the y-axis the measured loss rates. If we now look at the results of all the four approaches, we can see that they are mostly very close to the ground truth, especially for higher loss rates. The only thing that stands out here is that the t-bit is not that accurate for low loss percentages, as evidenced by larger confidence intervals here. The main reason is that the t-bit includes two pause phases, and thus it doesn't actually cover the whole traffic. Next, we wanted to find out about the timely behavior of the different approaches, and thus looked at individual measurement runs. What you can see on this slide are the first 10 seconds of one hand-picked measurement run, where we had configured a loss rate of 1%. Looking at the LBIT, we can see that it closely follows the ground truth, although there's always a slight timely delay. This is reasoned by the fact that the LBIT depends on the end host based loss detection, which takes a bit of time until it actually deems the packet to be lost. Next, looking at the qubit, we can see that it also follows the ground truth quite closely. We can also identify the longer algorithmic intervals. And the qubit actually represents an interpolation of the ground truth. Next, looking at the R bit, we can see that it is significantly higher than the others here in the beginning. And also, it starts later than the other two approaches. This is due to the fact that it builds upon the qubit and first has to wait until the first iteration of the qubit has succeeded. However, in the long run, it then also follows the ground truth quite closely. Finally, looking at the t-bit, the previously mentioned longer algorithmic intervals are now really visible because it is the only one to only produce three readings in the first second. Additionally, it also has the highest fluctuations in the measurements 
and takes really long time until it gets close to the ground truth. So summarizing, it can be said that the L bit is the closest representation of the ground truth, while the Q and R bit are not far behind. Only the T bit struggles a bit and takes a long time to get close to the ground truth. Let us finally get back to the question stated in our title. So which spin bit cousin is here to stay? Well, solely based on the measurement accuracy, the L bit seems to be the best choice as it closely follows the ground truth. However, it depends on the end host loss detection and there's always this slight temporal delay between the actual packet loss and its reporting. On the other hand, we've seen that there are longer algorithmic intervals for Q, R, and T, and these come with two disadvantages. First, there's a decrease in accuracy when they are subject to burst loss, as is evidence in our second experimental setting. What we did is configure increasing average burst sizes, and as our results indicate, the Q, R, and T bits struggle if the burst sizes increase. The second disadvantage of those longer algorithmic intervals is that they prolong the time until the measurement stabilizes. These results now stem from our third setting, where we investigated different flow lengths. As is evidenced in the plot, the different algorithms start their measurements at different times. So the L bit starts first, then the Q bit joins, afterwards the T bit joins, and finally the R bit joins. This observation is especially important if we want to observe short flows or if we want to have fast measurements. However, in the long run, all the measurements start to stabilize at the same time, so at roughly one to two megabytes. So overall, the measurement accuracy seems to be suitable in all of the four cases, although there are, of course, differences in them. But which of those approaches now to choose? I think that another property of those approaches will eventually be the deciding factor when choosing which of them to deploy, and that is their path segmentation properties. These eventually decide on how closely the network operators will be able to localize loss. And thus it actually depends on the needs of the operators on how fine-grained they want to localize the loss in their networks. Because from a measurement accuracy perspective, all of the approaches should provide reasonable results for that. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, time for one question to Ike. Thank you for your presentation. Let's see, and then uh, uh, let's see if I see anyone in the queue right now. Uh, not so while people are thinking, uh, let me try one question to you, Ike. Uh, do you think, uh, uh, have you thought about uh, trying to measure the duration of uh, packet loss burst? And uh, uh, do you think that would be feasible with uh, the, 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 the scenario that you have? So basically you mean like uh, how long the individual mm -hmm. bursts that we have uh, occur? Yeah, so uh, basically that is not directly the intention of the different techniques that we have there. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I actually didn't come up with them myself. So um, I, yeah, I don't think that those techniques are that feasible for that. Um, but um, yeah, there are ways of determining how long certain bursts take. Um, but I think that is mainly only possible for uh, the Q and R bits in that case, uh, because the others are not that feasible for that. Okay, thank you very much for. And uh, Cedric had the question, and I guess uh, you it disappeared from my screen. Uh, yeah, he's actually do you have a question? A question in, in the chat, I think. Um, oh, if you like. Uh, can you speak? Yeah, I can speak. I was just wondering if, if that instrumentation had an impact on the packet loss rate. So if you had all this uh, bits to measure the packet loss, do you, do you change the actual packet loss rate that you observe in the network? Uh, so in our setting, we um, only had like this artificial loss. So in that case, we didn't really impact uh, what, uh, so the, the, the actual packet loss rates. Uh, and I 
don't actually think that in, in, in reality that will be the case um, because um, as it is right now, the, the spin bit. Uh, We're ahead to it, basically. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that, that, that's what I was about to say something about. Uh, so basically, um, the uh, people in the IPVM working group are thinking about adding the, the lost bits to uh, the two reserve bits that are still available in the quick short header. And in that case, uh, that wouldn't really, um, yeah, so we would in that case only use uh, currently unused space for that. Uh, but obviously, if we add additional bits to the, uh, to the overall transmissions, then that might have an impact, uh, although I don't or I am not able to uh, quantify that uh, right now, but that's, uh, yeah, I think a, a valid thought about those uh, those additional bits in that case, yeah. Okay, I guess you read the fur uh, further questions to the panel. So let's, thank you very much. Ed. So Thanks. very nice work. And uh, let's go to the uh, uh, next uh, presentation. I guess the presenter we're going to be uh, Said uh, Saidi uh, from Max Planck Institute. Uh, he's a PhD student in computer science. Uh, please uh, can start the presentation, please. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my presentation. I'm Said Jawad Saidi, and today I am going to present our work on detecting consumer IoT devices through lens of an ISP. Consumer IoT devices have grown extremely popular uh, recently, and it has been projected that the number of deployed IoT devices will surpass 17 billion by 2023. These uh, devices provide a wide range of services from smart speakers to smart appliances, TVs, and surveillance cameras. However, it has been shown that these devices can be exploited, and one notable example is the Mirai attack, where millions of exploited devices participated in launching, uh, launching one of the large scale uh, DDoS attacks that crippled parts of the internet and service providers. Moreover, these devices can be exploited to exfiltrate private user information without users' knowledge or consent. All these problems brings us the question uh, for us as, as network operators can we identify and locate IoT devices that are connected to our networks? This problem can be studied in different networks, from sm uh, from small office to campus networks to even to large service providers. We collaborated with an ISP of 15 million customers, and we wanted to study this problem at the scale of an ISP. However, detecting IoT devices at the provider level is not an easy task. The reason is that traffic patterns across IoT devices are diverse. Deploying, uh, there, are, there have been some recent work that suggested that we can deploy some agent inside the premise of a customer. However, it's not scalable and it is privacy intrusive as well. And uh, active measurement approaches that uh, won't work if the devices are located behind the net. And moreover, if we want to do a deep packet inspection, we will face um, serious privacy concerns among the customers of an ISP. One of the readily available data sources are flow capture utilities such as NetFlow and IPFix. These data sources are already collected by service providers for their other operational purposes. They, uh, these data sets are sampled and they don't contain any payload, I, I, which means that they contain only headers of the packets like source IP, destination IP, and so on. This brings us to the question of uh, whether we can detect IoT devices using this limited, passive, and sparsely sample flow data in the wild. And if yes, at what granularities can we detect them? And how fast can we detect them? And how are IoT devices deployed today as observed in flow data? The key insight of our work is that devices that we've studied have shown repeating patterns of communication that appeared even in sparsely sampled data. We generated detection rules using extremely limited packet fields. And we were able to detect devices or generate rules for detection of devices from 77% of the study manufacturers. And we detected devices in a data set from an ISP from within minutes to hours. 
we leverage the fact that uh, your two devices, in order to provide their services, they have to communicate with certain backend infrastructure. And uh, if we focus on the destinations contacted by uh, these devices, can we, can we find out which of the subscribers of this ISP have which type of IoT device? Our methodology has five steps. First, we generated a ground truth IoT traffic. Second, we checked whether we can see traffic from a single device from a single vantage point at ISP, the data set from an ISP. And third, we identified which domains, IPs, and port numbers can be used to generate detection rules for different devices. And then, we, uh, of course, we cross-checked our detection rules. And finally, we, uh, we uh, applied our methodology on a data set from a large European ISP. Next, we generate ground truth IoT traffic. How we do it? We set up two test beds containing 56 unique IoT products from 40 vendors in these six different categories. We trigger devices to generate IoT traffic. And next, we connect our test beds to a home vantage point inside the premise of ISP and push back with IoT traffic to the internet and captured IoT traffic at these different locations as seen as uh, shown in the figure. We observe IoT activity uh, from, uh, from more than 64% of devices now tested in the ISP data set. The next step is to basically identify which domains, IP addresses, and port numbers that we have generated in the ground truth traffic can be used to generate detection rules for finding IoT devices. As it's an involved process, I'm not going into the details, but in, in, as an overview, we have generated uh, detection rules for as, at three different levels of granularity. The finest one is the product level. Well, we can say what type of product it is. For example, if it's an Amazon Echo or not. And the next level of granularity is the manufacturer level, where we could only say it's a Samsung device. We could only say what's the manufacturer. And the, the closest one is the platform level, where we could only say it's an IoT device, but we couldn't say what product or which manufacturer it is. The generated rules account for 77% of the manufacturers in our test beds. Next, we apply our methodology on a data set from a large European ISP. This ISP has more than 15 million, uh, 15 million customers. In this figure, we see the duration of the data set that we have observed. And in the, in the y-axis, we see the number of unique subscribers that uh, per hour that had the uh, inferred or uh, uh, that had the inferred IoT device. What we see here, we were able to detect more than one million subscribers with Alexa-enabled devices. Alexa-enabled device is any device that responds to Amazon Alexa voice service commands. We also observed some diurnal patterns for Alexa and Samsung IoT devices. The next question is that if we, uh, what happens if we increase our observation period. Here we see the uh, same plot as uh, previous plot, but with the 24-hour um, observation period. We see here that increasing observation period help detecting even more IoT devices. Next takeaway is that we see that the number of detected devices are stable. And there is not a lot of, uh, there are not a lot of fluctuations in the number of devices. In general, we detected IoT activity for 20% of the subscribers of the ISP. Now, if we zoom in on this 32 uh, IoT device type, uh, we, have, we will have this plot. Here, we, in the x axis, in the left part, in the y axis, we see the, each individual uh, device. In the x axis, again, number of devices, uh, in the uh, number of devices per day. 24, 24 hours, and they are also uh, categorized according to their ranking in the country, uh, in the Amazon ranking of, in the country of ISP. For the ones that we didn't find a ranking, they are put into other category. What we see here is that device popularity 
in the Amazon and ISP flow correlated. Our methodology has its own limitations. First, generating rules requires studying a range of manufacturers' products. And if the domains and IP addresses that uh, devices are using change, then we have to also update the rules. And if the devices do not show or do not have um, enough activity, it will be challenging to observe them in the sample for data sets. In conclusion, we have shown a methodology to detect IoT devices based on limited sample flow data. We detected devices from more than 77% of studied IoT manufacturers in a large ISP from, uh, by, uh, by looking, uh, by considering minutes to hours of um, uh, data and both popular and not so popular. In future, we want to identify non-essential traffic generated by OLT devices at the scale of an ISP. If you are interested in the domains and signatures that we've generated to detect these devices, you can either scan this QR code or visit the following URL. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Saeed. Uh, we have time for questions. One question, please. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, I, yes, do I hear anyone? No one in the queue? Okay, uh, I have a question. Uh, 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 do you use uh, just ports and IP address source and des uh, destination IP address and, and ports, or do you use anything more for the rules? Uh, for the rules, uh, we use ports, protocols, and destination IP addresses. Protocols as well. Okay. Oh. Yes, yes. Okay. And we also and we, we generated rules to generate or uh, finding which IP addresses to use. We uh, use the domain names first because we have captured the domain names in the in the lab. Because we cannot use all the domain, we cannot not, uh, use all the IP addresses that we uh, that are contacted by the IP, by the devices. Some of these IP addresses belong to uh, generic uh, infrastructure like. Um, Akamai or uh, some cloud uh, services which are shared by contacted by large uh, range of users and devices mm -hmm. okay okay and um, and and you identified uh, I in your presentation you said uh, how many uh, different uh, uh, IOT device you could were able to identify I uh, yeah, so we had uh, 56 unique uh, IoT devices uh, from 40 manufacturers, and we have uh, we were able, if I remember correctly, for four uh, 33 unique devices and uh, yeah, 35 unique devices, we were able to do this. And but some of these devices belong to same manufacturer, and uh, for those devices, we could only say what is the manufacturer of this device. And not only a unique product. Okay, uh, very nice, interesting. And, and you said that you you can share that, right? Uh, uh, yeah, with the community, right? So. Yeah. Uh, okay, I have one question from David Oren. Could you please speak, please? David. Uh, how do I? What glitch on I'm muting. So I assume that as an owner of one of these things, I really ought to use a VPN so that the ISP can't see my IoT devices. Yes. Yes. If you use if you use a VPN, use a VPN, VPN then, then we only we see only VPN traffic. VPN. So what do you think the privacy implications of your local ISP being able to fingerprint all these IoT devices in people's houses? Uh, there are uh, multiple there are use multiple cases, cases for that. The first, the one, first is that, one is that uh, uh, if, 
device is uh, is known that uh, being infected or participating in a large scale attack, uh, ISPs can notify uh, the users and the, the owners of that device and say, okay, you have a device that is infected and it has been shown uh, in case of Mirai attack where ISPs were actively engaging in notifying customers with the infected devices and even taking uh, extreme, extreme measures, measures, for example, for example by, by redirecting, redirecting the traffic, traffic to a, to a portal, portal saying, saying, okay, you have this device, device that is infected, infected. please do something, Please do something about, about, it. about it. Well, that'll work yes. for about five minutes until the malware guy figures out how to, how to hide the identity of the device. Okay, you mean that, uh, mean that uh, once you, once know, you that know that this customer, this customer has, a, has this device, 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 has this device, has this device. Uh, of course, yeah, with of course, the consent, and it can be, it should be an obtain uh, service, not without a customer's consent. Uh, you can always, you, you will know that this customer has, unless this has this type of device, and uh, the, and you don't need to repeatedly uh, detect the same device for the customer, unless if the device is moving from one customer, this device is only active for a few minutes in that customers. And in our um, uh, setting, the subscribers were home cost, uh, for, were home users and or uh, fixed uh, subscribers and not a mobile one. Thank you. So uh, thank you yeah. very much. I guess we defer further questions for the uh, panel. We have to move on for because of timing. So thank you very much, Said. Uh, thank you. Very interesting. Uh, and so uh, please, the next uh, uh, paper will be presented by Simon Bauer, who uh, is at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, he's a research associate there. So please, the video. Hi everyone, my name is Simon Bauer. I'm a research associate at the Technical University of Munich here as the Chair of Network Architectures and Services. And today I want to talk about our work on the evolution of internet flow characteristics. As we all know, there's ongoing change uh, on the internet regarding new technologies, adapting user behavior or um, changing internet services uh, we are all aware of uh, improving network expansions. Uh, we all observed the uh, smartphone boom during the last decade. We are aware of the Internet of Things that rises, and of course, we know about audio and video streaming services. At the same time, previous studies uh, present methodologies to survey flow characteristics like flow duration, flow size, or flow rates. Um, but recent insights into flow characteristics um, in the internet are rare. And therefore, our paper pursues the question how flow characteristics changed during the last few years. To answer such question, uh, our paper surveys the distribution and correlation of flow characteristics and applies different taxonomies to assess the relevance of heavy hitter flows in the sense of elephant flows, but also in the sense of so-called big fast flows. Well, before we start talking about our methodology and our measurement results, let me briefly introduce a scalable flow analysis tool implemented in Go. Um, that provides large scalability due to parallelized packet parsing and flow aggregation. Um, the tool is published as free and open source with our paper. The tool consists of five major components, which are illustrated on the right. So the first component is a reader that reads packets um, from a PCAP file. Then we have multiple parsers that extract packet features from such red packets. And so those packet features are then written into a ring buffer component that is proposed to reorder packets. Well, a regular routine then writes um, such reordered packet information into pools 
where we collect package features per flow until a flow terminates and after its termination um, flow data is written to the metric component where we then calculate our flow characteristics. Let's talk about flows. We identify flows based on the IP5 tuple as we will focus on TCP traffic uh, for our study. Um, we identify the start of TCP flows with a three-way handshake, of course, and we terminate a TCP flow when we observe a connection teardown. If um, there's an idle period in a, of a flow for a certain timeout period, or we observe a freshly established three-way handshake of a IP5 tuple that is already tracked. For identified flows, we calculate the flow size in the sense of the sum of layer four payload sizes. Um, we calculate flow duration as the time interval between the first and the last packet we observe, and uh, we calculate flow rate um, at the average data rate based on flow size and flow duration. For our study, uh, we compose a data set consisting of 28 traces provided by Kaider. Such traces uh, have anonymized IP addresses and no layer 4 payloads. And each trace uh, is, provides one hour of traffic that is captured at a 10 gigabit um, per second ISP backbone link. As illustrated below, on the timeline, we select 23 traces taken in Chicago between 2008 and 2016, and five traces taken in New York between 2018 and 2020. As you see, we have three periods without traces for several months. So on average, uh, we, we select traces um, in an interval of three months, but there are three intervals without uh, traces, larger intervals without traces, because there are simply no traces available. Well, and uh, regarding uh, pre-processing of such traffic, uh, we only consider TCP flows that are longer than or equal to 200 milliseconds. Um, this is also done by related work and proposed to filter out quite short flows, because calculating flow rates um, or calculated flow rates are may falsified for short flows if in case of single packet flows or if all packets are sent back to back. So let's talk about selected measurement results. So uh, regarding the evolution of uh, heavy hitters, um, related work proposes a definition uh, of heavy hitter traffic based on the 99th percentile of a characteristic. So the 99th percentiles of flow duration, flow size and flow rate. So we analyzed the evolution of such 99th percentiles over time, as you can see plotted here on the right. Let me point out two um, major findings. So regarding the uh, 99th percentile of flow duration here on top of uh, the plot, uh, we observe that there's only little increase during the years 2008 until 2013, but afterwards we observe an increase per factor 1.5 between June 2013 and March 2016. A further major finding uh, of that analysis is the increase for, of uh, the 99th percentile of flow rates, which uh, refers to the bottom plot here. And we here and here we observe a clear trend towards uh, larger flow rates in the 99th percentile, um, i.e. an increase from around 400 kilobits per second up to 800 kilobits per second in 2015. Next, we were interested in the relevance of uh, such heavy hitter traffic. Therefore, we calculated the share of transmitted bytes by such flows uh, within the 99th percentile for each flow characteristic. We did not find a specific trend over time, so, we, so here the table shows the average across all traces taken in Chicago. In the second column, on the, in the right column, we see the share of bytes transmitted by different percentiles and, um, well, especially um, the flows within the 99th percentile of flow size um, represent a large share of the totally transmitted bytes with uh, nearly 90% um, of all TCP bytes transmitted by such 1% of flows. 
Further, we had a look at so-called big fast flow. So Zhang et al. introduced a 2-2 two -two taxonomy um, based on two threshold values uh, to group flows regarding their size and their flow rate. And we had a closer look at the relevance of such big fast flows, which are represented by only a small share of flows, but as we will see, um, have a yeah large relevance regarding the share of bytes that they transmit. So we uh, define three threshold pairs. Um, the first pair refers to the original um, threshold values from Chang et al i.e. 100 kilobytes regarding size and 10 kilobyte per second for flow rate. And then we increase the thresholds by uh, one magnitude for pair two and pair three. Let me highlight the increase of um, the share of bytes transmitted by the second threshold pair illustrated in green. So here we observe an increase of, big of bytes transmitted by big fast flows. Um, between 20 and 30 percent for traces in 2018 and 2000, until 2010, up to um, between 40 and 50 percent of all bytes transmitted by TCP. For more recent traces taken in Chicago, the values um, for the New York data set are smaller, which can be traced back to a larger share of small flows for such traces. To conclude my talk, let me summarize our findings. So as we uh, have seen here in the talk, the and we observe a significant increase of the 99th percentiles of flow duration and rate. We uh, find a large significant of heavy hitters regarding the share of transmitted bytes. And we observe an increase regarding the relevance of big fast flows during the past years. Further, and not included in the talk, but in our paper, you will find an analysis of the distribution of flow characteristics over time and a study of correlation coefficients between the flow characteristics where we can confirm uh, findings of previous studies, especially regarding a strong positive correlation between flow rate and flow size. And that's it from my side. And now I'm happy and looking forward to answer your question. very much, Simon. Uh, thank you very much. And I uh, uh, have time for one question before the panel. Okay, I guess before the frame for the... I, I have one quick question, perhaps. Uh, 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 there, there has been a, a, a change in flow since the pandemic. So are you looking into that, the change of the flows in the last year? Yes, so so we did not do that yet, but we definitely plan to do that. So uh, as you have seen, we now worked on the Kaida data set. Um, well, and Kaida provides one trace per year. And so we're looking for further data sets that allow a more fine grained study. And yeah, especially regarding the pandemic during the last few months. So yeah, this will be will be a topic for the future. Sure, sure, very nice. Uh, there is one question here from uh, Jen. Uh, can you please? Yes. Speak? Hi. Hi, Simon. Thanks for a nice talk. Uh, I was wondering. I'm not sure about the data set. Um, do you know something about how the parallelization of flows changed over the years? So there. Um, so like the change from HTTP one to let's say quick or HTTP two. Uh, where now things start to get parallelized over the same connection, so you would see less parallelization. Do you see something in those traces, or is that hidden through the anonymization? So we we did not have a closer look on that aspect of the data set. So uh, this so I can't really answer that question. Um, but what I can tell you is that the the IP addresses in the data set are, are anonymized. So I'm not sure whether this affects the the uh, study you just proposed. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you very much. I think it's it's better to invite all the speakers to the room and now and and collect questions for everyone. Uh, so I'm not sure how to do that, but I think yes, okay, it's coming. Uh, <clears throat> 
Okay, I think we we have everyone here. So, uh, do I see <clears throat> any more questions from the audience? Or you can ask questions for each other also. That's in fact a very nice audience. We have 80 people to uh, the, the audience. Mm. <clears throat> So, let me. okay, there is uh, Ali. Uh, can you speak, please? Uh, I guess there is one in queue, uh, Ali, who's saying you, you can just speak, please. There was a permission, so I just allow it. Can uh, anybody hear me? Yeah, now, yes, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, the question is for the Simon. Uh, uh, do you uh, see uh, any uh, anything related to the I just walking over your paper? So, what is there any correlation between the the uh, the IPv6 and and the port? Correspondingly, being used because the microservice architecture is dominating the development. So I'm just, uh, have you considered that aspect as well? Stop typing so, or turn off your microphone. So I'm not sure whether I understood you correctly because the audio was not so so good. Sorry, I can repeat. Uh, so if the question, if I understood it correctly, the question is whether there are some differences regarding IPv4 and IPv6 traffic, right? Yes. Okay, so we did not do an analysis of this in depth. So the current uh, state of the analyzer hashes IP addresses um, to provide a faster, faster handling and um, further step of anonymization. Uh, so we're currently working to to add IP addresses in plain, and then we would able to to have a look at IPv4 versus IPv6 too. Okay. Thank you. So, anyone else? Uh, let me remove Ali from Q. Uh, anyone else for questions? And I guess I, 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 if, if not, I have a question for uh, Justin uh, uh, for the first talk. Uh, do you foresee in your in your presentation and your uh, environment, any performance issues in, uh, to implement the, the solution, the collection of all the results, so the performance overheads, have you uh, thought about that? Or if any, or do you foresee any problem? Yeah, that, so that's a good question. So can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah, 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 perfect. Yeah, okay. So actually the, um, the overhead is, uh, again, it's all on IOM. So the overhead introduced by the cross-layer telemetry is just a netlink call. So that's not that big. And all the overhead is on the IOM side. And so we have already measured the impact of IOM uh, in another paper. And so unsurprisingly, the more you insert, uh, the more it drops. So you have to find uh, a compromise um, depending on your hardware and, and a lot of things. Okay. Okay. So perhaps you 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 see that more when in the real implementation you you tune it uh, better than you 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 make. It yeah. And by the way, just just a small notification to operators uh, that IOM is now available in the kernel. So it's for from mm -hmm. two or two or three days, and it will be available in five point fourteen version. So. Okay. okay. Great. Thanks. 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 Very nice. Thank you. Uh, people, uh, yes, yes. calling, Call please. please. Uh, I have a, a sort of fairly general question for perhaps most of the presenters. Uh, the, 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 the talk about spin bits, uh, I mean, the, the spin bits obviously came from QUIC initially. Um, for the other talks, does the presence of QUIC uh, and the deployment of QUIC affect uh, uh, the, the types of systems you're building or the behaviors you expect to see? 
So is the question for everyone uh, uh, calling? Or uh, I, I guess I guess for everyone apart from the uh, the spin bit talk, although uh, I'm happy for everyone to answer it. <laughs> okay, who wants to start that? I can start if you want. Uh, the answer is uh, no, there is no problem. So short answer, quick. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's easy. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else would like to get Yeah, so, so we also consider to, to detect quick traffic uh, in our data set, um, but there was not a significant share. So we should not have a closer look. OK, but, but the tools can detect it. Yes, yes, and also uh, the analysis tool we implemented as a, as a capable to be extended for, for further headers and protocols, so also this would be feasible. Okay, good. Is there anyone else would like to? Uh, yeah, I can comment on this. Yes, uh, as far as I know, since in our work we are mostly Focus. We don't look into the header at all, and we won't. We would probably won't be able to distinguish between Quick and other protocols. Uh, I would say it won't affect detection because we are mostly focusing on the destinations, or yeah, something like that. Yeah, but but it doesn't help obfuscate the traffic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for questions? Uh, I have one quick question for Ike. Do, did I pronounce your name correct? Yes? OK. Yep. Uh, 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 did you contrast the, the, the measures you, you talk about in your paper, uh, uh, the, uh, like a, a passive measure, which it's good, but they, did you contrast for packet loss of active measurements, the difference of doing that, or do you see any reason to compare? Yeah, so in, in, in our work, we, we didn't do that, so we were just interested in mm -hmm. finding out um, how well the different approaches uh, can actually uh, detect the, the loss that's happening, and actually the the, the, uh, the normal traffic that we were sending was kind of the, the active measurement part on that. Um, and I think uh, the, the general idea of those uh, approaches is also to kind of not have to use active measurements um, so that we can um, yeah, keep the, the additional overhead uh, on, the, on the network low and just measure it on the, on the already passing traffic without having to actually uh -huh. insert additional traffic. So we, so we didn't. No, okay. We didn't do it. No, no, I, I, I understand. My, my question is more like if you uh, 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 would uh, think would be a, uh, uh, try good to compare one against the other, not in terms of overhead. Of course, the overhead, it, it, it's much more inactive measurement, but in terms of accuracy, you don't see any, 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 any difference of doing that? Uh, yeah, do you so, expect so any difference? Yeah, so I, th I think the, the, the main thing is that if you use uh, active measurements, then you won't be able to like get the loss that is happening in your network and under the normal conditions. Um, and thus you would always kind of have a different picture than what you will, would get when you just uh, use those uh, different loss techniques here. Uh, and so I don't think that this contrasting at that point uh, is uh, something that I would consider. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any other question? Folks in the audience, we still have time. Uh, Do I see anyone trying to ask questions? Hello? Uh, please raise your hand and you show up in the queue. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 
Well, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> uh, okay. Uh, uh, I have a question to uh, uh, Simon. Uh, I guess in the in the, your paper you say that. Uh, 70% of flows transmit at a rate between one kilobit per second and a hundred kilobit per second. Uh, uh, I, I, I kind of wonder, is that, uh, uh, do you expect this transmission rates or did I get it wrong? It seems that slow transmission uh, rate. There is any reason for that or do you expect that or I'm just uh, 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 interpreting it wrong? So, if I understood you correctly, the question is, uh, uh, or you you mentioned that we observed a large share of flows within quite a quite a small uh, range of mm -hmm. the rate spectrum, right? Um, yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, spontaneously, I don't have an, an explanation for this. Um, mm -hmm. So we we plan to have a closer look onto ports and uh, even IP prefixes. Um, that may allow us to differ between different kinds of flows, um, then I might be able to answer your question. That would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks a lot. Folks, uh, well, I guess people are, uh, maybe in Europe it's, it, well, it is uh, late in Europe, not for me, but <laughs> so people want to sleep. <laughs> so, uh, very nice talks. I, I learned a lot from you. So I hope the audience uh, enjoy it. I say we have a, a large crowd watching. I certainly uh, uh, will refer your, your work to uh, uh, my students. So thank you everyone for of being here it was really nice and uh, uh hope you, the audience enjoy so thank you very much for everyone andra you want to say something oops i guess we can close the session uh, for today. Okay. So thank you. Thank everyone. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.